Welcome to day 10 of painting and still life painting. Um, so as we jump into today's painting, um, as I alluded to in the description of this video, um, I really have to get to that measuring spoon. Uh, so now these areas are just lagging, like properly lagging behind the rest of everything. And that is a problem um, because as I want to as I put them in, I don't want them to look as if they've been almost like photoshopped in. So um, they're part of the overall statement. And simply put, I just have to, I just have to <laughs> attend to the things that uh, have been neglected. So nothing special there. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the background. And if you have your coffee as well with me, um, it should be coffee hour, coffee, coffee painting hour. I don't know. Um, the background, so the background is really, it's neat. Background is, uh, for what it is, it's just inherently interesting. I'd like to talk a little bit about my backgrounds. Um, when I first started painting, the customary practice in a painting studio over in Italy was we just literally had um, cloths and we would just put the color of the cloth up. But I looked at, uh, the studio was not focused on still life painting at all. Uh, the studio that I uh, the studio of the Atelier that I have run here on Long Island for 13 years now. Um, I have focused much more on still life than over in Italy. Not a criticism, not patting myself on the back. I just, that's what I did. And the thing I didn't like over overseas was in the academic environment of the studio. Um, the backgrounds were all really drab cloths. And every still life painting had like the same like turquoise, the same as, and just saw the sash of the drape behind it. It was just really boring um, and depressing and um, academic, and I, I just didn't like it. So as soon as I got back to New York, um, they, I live on the south shore of Long Island, and there are all these wonderful antique shops that are still holding on by their fingernails, and they dot Montauk Highway running along the south shore. And so I stop, and they have these doors leaning up outside, and I'll pick one up for like 10 bucks. And so I have a whole collection of doors, like way, way more than this. This is a gift from a friend of mine, Donna, who uh, lives down in Florida, and for which I'm very grateful. Um, and then through the years, I pick garbage out of people's yards. I do, but it's on the curb. But uh, I always look for texture and just visual interest. So the background for this piece brings a lot to the story. Um, how much am I gonna put in? I don't know. Sometimes the background is just a suggestion and I just, I literally just wash something in. Sometimes the background is really important to the final statement. And so I'll go into great detail in certain areas of the background. But what I can assure you, what I can say with certainty is I never, from the upper left hand corner to the bottom right hand corner of the background, put in tons of information. Um, because in my opinion, that would be overwhelming your viewer's eye. Um, other artists would say, well, I do that and I don't overwhelm my viewer's eye. I actually would agree with that. I know certain artists put in incredible amounts of detail, but they control it and balance it in such a way where it doesn't overflow, overwhelm the viewer's eye. Just for me, uh, I like my backgrounds to re retreat a little bit more. That's simply it. So um, that is definitely gonna be a focus of mine today as well. Um, in particular, right here on the side of the pot. So the other thing I want to talk about today is actually the attack that we have on the canvas itself with our brushes, like the way in which we put down paint. And the further along um, through the years, I'm, I'm very grateful that I, as a young man, I'm very grateful that I did not have access to any institution or strong personalities that said to me that, I don't know, 19th century is the greatest moment in painting ever. Um, I never had that. And so all I really had as a young man was dictionaries, I mean, uh, encyclopedias with paintings in them, libraries. Um, I really liked Sister Wendy's program. If you know Sister Wendy's program on TV, she's fantastic. She's a great, great, just a wonderful soul. She passed away about a year ago, I think. Um, and then, um, when I was old enough to take a train about like 15 years old, um, then I had the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. And so 
I was able to appreciate so many different moments in painting. And so for me, um, a 16th century painting, uh, early 17th century painting by Peter Kleiss, um, a Belgian painter, I could appreciate that just as much as I could appreciate, like let's say, a 17th century painting, late, seven, yeah, late 17th century painting by Chardin. Um, so I, my eye could just hop all over the place. Um, I, could even, I could even jump over and get, go all the way up to the 20th century and look at some really neat um, still life paintings by the Dutch painter uh, Dick Ket, K-E-T. So in short, I like looking at these different artists and seeing how they view their still life. And then I kind of like, it's almost as if I have a big pocket right here. And I'm like, you know what? I like what you do, Peter Kleiss. And I put that in right here. And then I see something that Chardin does. And I'm like, and thank you very much, Chardin. And I take it and I pop it in my pocket. I don't need to be a strict adherent or disciple to one or the other. I just pick up moments that I delight in, that my eye just really enjoys. So I wanna show you two paintings today by two artists separated by 100 years. Um, Peter Kleiss was born in 1597 in Belgium. And so we'll jump over right now to Peter Kleiss. And Peter Kleiss's very um, tightly rendered compositions where you look at his work and Peter Kleiss, his work, um, as, you, as you look at that, as you look at that glass, just think of how the glass is so finely rendered. The glass is perfectly um, placed, um, uh, I'm sorry, not placed, but perfectly rendered in such a way that the light is actually flowing through. And if you were to zoom in on just the rendering of that glass, it's just an, it's an amazing painting. It's, it's wonderful. Now, this piece, as you get really close to it, um, you cannot even see, I mean, if you try your hardest, you can't even see a single brush stroke. I mean, you have to have your nose to the canvas. And at that point, the guard is gonna come over and yell at you and kick you out of the museum. But if you're looking at a Peter Kleist that close, you have to have your nose to the canvas before you start seeing brushwork. And that is really enjoyable. That is for us, as viewers, um, as uh, his audience, let's say, um, he, it's a thorough statement. It's not lacking in anything. Um, and he still is in control of his information where even though every leaf is painted so well, he's left broad areas in deep silhouette so that our eye is not overpowered by too many leaves kind of encroaching on the central focus. So again, Peter Kleiss, born 1597, and now let's jump one century later to Chardin, who's born roughly at the end of the 1600s. So Chardin is a painter who worked in a much broader way. Um, his, work is, his work is really, for me, um, I kind of don't know how to put into words what I admire about him because he has an atmosphere and I can't really articulate it verbally, but he puts his paint down in much broader, like almost like mosaic bits of glass. And he doesn't quite render and finish his statement. He doesn't connect the dots. And so there's like an earthiness and an acceptance that, hey, I'm working in paint here. I admit I'm working in paint. And in fact, I enjoy the paint for paint's sake. Um, Chardin, he is definitely like my favorite still life painter for that reason, because he never hides his medium and he really has no desire to do it. Whereas again, jumping back to Peter Kleiss, Peter Kleiss um, was very much an artist who his, his brushwork was so perfect and refined um, that it almost seems like, in a way, it almost seems like life itself. And I just find, I just find these things very interesting. Jumping back again to Chardin, Chardin, a painter from Paris, France, um, just a few hundred miles away from 
Peter Kleiss and a hundred years away. Um, but again, the, the, the atmosphere and the acceptance of the meeting, medium and being willing to show his audience how he was actually working. So with that, um, the question pops up, who is better, uh, Peter Kleiss or uh, Chardin? Um, you'll, have, you'll have disciples of Peter Kleiss say that Peter Kleiss was much more of a refined artist, much better artist. You'll have disciples of Chardin and they say, no, Chardin captures the spirit of the thing in succinct terms. I really think it's okay to say they were both masters. Um, one is not better than the other. They're really, each of them, they have perfect statements for what they were trying to do. And to that extent, I would say, I definitely lean more towards Chardin. He is probably my favorite silly painter, but I really love Peter Kleiss. And the two, and they almost cancel each other out in a funny way because they're doing things very differently. But you don't have to really feel that way. You can say, no, this is a complete statement. It's perfect, and this is a complete statement. And I'm gonna learn, because what I love about Peter Kleiss is I love the glass that he painted and how the light entered into it and turned that liquid, I mean, it just glows. I love the silhouette of the leaves. But then with Chardin, I love the chunkiness and I love, so what I actually do with both of those painters is say, you're both equal as masters. I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna put you here, I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna put you there, and I'm going to bring that into my work. So where does that apply to today's painting? It applies right here. Um, Chardin, again, he goes in and he puts that paint down with um, a very direct, certain way where he suggests the form rather than rendering the form. But I wanna go, I kinda wanna go Peter Kleiss right here. And I wanna like really go to town and paint like the swirls in here and all these different moments. I, I do wanna do that. So I'm gonna pull a little bit from the different worlds, the suggestion, but then also the crisp single hair brush strokes in certain areas of the piece. So with that, I'm gonna run back to my uh, palette and I'm going to take a sip of my coffee and I'm gonna jump in and start mixing paints. Okay, so I will put my cup over there and off to the much neglected measuring spoon. So feel free as you watch this to have a heart attack with me as I put that in and mess up that whole area of the canvas. You're welcome to join me for this adventure. Oh, I forgot to put my burnt umber out. Um, if you notice, I don't have a lot of paint out today. Um, I haven't had a lot of paint out for a few days. The reason is very simple. I haven't been making huge decisions. I've been making smaller decisions. And so when I started the canvas, I definitely, definitely need um, a lot of paint out. When I am making massive decisions everywhere, I definitely need a lot of paint out. But right now, as I work, I just, I'm observing small relationships all over the place. And until I see a big um, shift become like necessary, I'm just not going to even need that much paint. So I'm right over here in the corner and I have like a mid-tone value right here. And I'm going to begin. When I look at that spoon, if somebody knows the metal of that spoon, if it's tin or if it's pewter, like I don't I don't know my kitchen metals. Some people can look at something and be like, that's a Copper amalgamation of, uh, I don't even know. Um, I can't do that, I have no ability. Okay, so I'm definite of one thing. I want that light on that spoon. I want it to be brilliant, but I don't want the light on the spoon to overpower the egg beside it. There is a certain warmth in that gray. And so I've just touched it with um, Naples Yellow Deep. Oh, 
and I should add, uh, off screen yesterday, um, I did record some more footage. I haven't had a time to process it. I'll put that up on Facebook before the end of the day, but I did more painting over here. Maybe I went a little bit overboard. Um, it was really bright at the end of the day. It was beautiful. So maybe I went a little over the top, but I could always knock it back. Um, so I did a little bit more painting right here and brought out the rust on the cast iron a little bit more as well. Uh, today is kind of an overcast day and it is not uh, a day for color for me, not for this piece. And if you guys have questions or anything like that, as ever, please feel free to write in. Uh, my early marks, I'm really, I'm really not overly concerned with the notion that I can get this in perfectly. Um, I'm going to be making mistakes. I'm going to be stumbling about. And I just allow for that for a little while. So I don't get mad at myself if I have to wipe all this out right now and move it over. I just don't even get mad at myself. And I think I have a question right here. Oh, okay, so Roseanne, you were asking uh, the size of this canvas right here. Um, it's the length of my arm plus the length of my arm and a quarter. So it's like a cubit by um, a cubit by a cubit and a third, if that helps. You, you don't want ancient Egyptian measurements, the length of my arm a cubit. All right, I'm going to get a, a measuring tape and I'll measure it out for you. I don't know why I'm always messing with you, Roseanne. So, um, <laughs> no, I actually don't know the size off the top of my head, but um, I will grab a measuring tape and measure that out in just a, just a little bit. All right, so putting in big abstract shapes, I'm really, really focusing right now. I'm really focusing on not putting this in accurately uh, and precisely with single hairbrushes. I'm putting it in big and broad and sloppy, you know, big, big, broad, chunky shapes because this might be a really terrible decision. And if it's a terrible decision, I'm going to want to know it's a terrible decision before I lavish an hour of painting on it, not after. All right, so getting a little bit more. And cool. Thank you, Margaret. So this is 18 inches by 24 inches. Somehow it didn't look 18 by 24 to me um, as I looked at it. Thank you, Margaret. Um, somehow it didn't look 18 by 24. It looked a little bit different, but I guess it's because it's on its side. But that's a good question, Roseanne, because um, I think we're up to about like 10 people now who are all doing, if not like, you know, this still life setting, but they've done variants on it. Um, and it's good to know the size that I'm working at. So I'll make a note of that for upcoming videos to let you know the size of the canvas that I'm working on. That was a great question. And another question. Um, is your easel set up right next to your still life? Yeah, and so, Allison. So Allison, um, Allison just asked, let me pull my chair over here. Is my easel set up right beside uh, my canvas? Um, is my canvas set up right beside my still life set up? Sorry. Um, the answer is yes. And I literally have it one to one, like perfectly set up. Uh, I have my still life a little bit in front of the setup because I felt that if I was working exactly one-to-one, -one, um, I felt the objects would crowd the composition. Like imagine if 
the cast iron pot went to right here. And imagine if the bag went to right there. Um, it would just feel like an overcrowded elevator. Like it needs breathing room around it. And so as you look at this, I actually made everything in the whole entire composition. Um, I had made everything kind of go down a little bit, which is not entirely true because I painted this much bigger than it actually is. I painted this definitely a little bit smaller. I painted this narrower. Um, the eggs, not really sure. Maybe that's a little bit, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about the egg. But in all, the, the, the canvas is slightly forward so that I wouldn't have that, that crowding taking place. Um, the whole way that I was trained over in Italy um, was through sight size. And if you don't know much about sight size, um, sight size is a portrait painting technique uh, that um, there's significant scholarship that has been done on it where certain painters, not all painters, certain painters used it where they placed the canvas near the portrait sitter. Um, I am not a strict adherent to it in the sense of that's the only way to paint. Um, I trained before that in comparative, and there's in comparative means you compare the size of this to the size of that. Like, that's a really crude uh, summary. Side size is more so flicking your eye back and forth and lining up the things perfectly so they fit side by side. Um, so I'm kind of like the bastard child of comparative side size and um, constructive, where I really take what I like from side size, I take what I like from comparative, and then constructive uh, painting is where you're actually building the geometric shapes as you want to see them. So I want to see this set up a little bit better than nature has given it to me. And so I just build it differently, if that makes any sense. Um, so that was an excellent question about the placement of the painting and of the easel. And yet yeah, a little bit forward so that I can get like that nice compositional um, proportion. All right, so here's something that comes up a lot with me in painting. I make a big decision. I want to know if the decision was horrific, as it oftentimes is, or if the decision is a good one. Um, what I do is I will mass in a shape, such as I've done right now, and after I've massed in that shape, what I'll do is let it sit there in big abstract, almost like pieces, and then I will ignore it for a while. So I have put about four to five minutes into painting that spoon, and I don't know for the life of me if it's a good idea or a bad idea. To tell you the truth, I don't really care as of yet. If it was a terrible idea, I can fix it probably in two to three minutes. So terrible idea, I can repair it two to three minutes. Wonderful idea, well I can render it for another hour if I want. I wanna see light passing beyond it. So I really have to let this decision, I really need to hear it out. I can't just look at it um, without putting in the abstract, abstract pieces. Thoroughly, so, uh, for, I'm sorry, not thoroughly, but somewhat thoroughly. So I'm gonna put in a little bit of light passing underneath the spoon. And I'm gonna carve the shape a little bit more accurately. And I would really, I'd really compare this to writing an essay. So many of us as we write, will put, we have a thought, we have a, an impulse. And as we have that impulse, we will, we'll put down that information on the page and then we kind of stare at it and we think, does this statement fit in with the rest of what I'm doing in this essay. Some, sometimes, like, in some way, shape, or form, that's how I view painting, where 
I put down an idea. I see how it speaks to everything else. If it's decent and the thing is still holding together, um, I'll leave it, but I'm gonna go elsewhere. The problem is when we go to write an essay, and I learned this in college, I would spend like two and a half hours trying to get the opening sentence. When I soon learned that that was a very poor way of crafting an essay, you really have to move forward and just keep keep the ideas coming. And so that's why in painting, I put down the idea and then I kind of abandon it. So with that right there, again, I don't want to say that that is painted well. Um, I don't want to say it's painted poorly. I really don't want to say much about that. I just want to move on and then come back to it in five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour and a half, whatever it is, and say, wow, that was a really terrible idea, Kevin. Poorly done. And then I just wipe it up. Or 45 minutes to an hour, I look at it, and I'm like, I like it, I just did this wrong. It needs to, it needs to rotate a little bit more. It needs to be over here. Um, but I can't judge it too quickly. So I'm standing back here and I'm going to willfully and intentionally now jump to another part of the painting until my eye is fresh and unbiased enough to return to that with a clear eye. So, okay, so now where else do I want to go in order to, um, where else do I want to go in order to kind of push this whole idea of the background? Should I start here? Should I start there? I've been wanting to start over here on the left-hand side because I darkened that a little bit the other day and then I felt like I lost some of the contrast here and I don't know if that's too dull now. So I'm going to start out right over here and just tackle the background. And it is pretty bright. Um, the problem I ran into with the background earlier was let's generalize the families of the colors. Um, the family of this color of the tabletop is red. Um, so we're just going to say that that is red right here. And then the family of this background over here is gray. Um, obviously, you could say, well, I see a whole lot of, like, you know, that raw wood warmth coming through. So no, I see a lot more color. I do too, but I need to kind of push them apart because at one point, this color and this color were creeping too close to each other. So... Looking back here, I'm just going to push that should have been a brighter color for the background, a brighter value, sorry. And so I'm going back again, right into it. And I like that. That's great. That was perfect. And I really like that. Okay, that is saving an area of the canvas that started to disappear. This can't be murky right over here. This has to be full of life. That can be murky. I don't really care. That can go off into the distance, but this has to shine. It's too important in area to kind of slip into nothing. And so just with that, I think that looks a million times better. And I might even push it. Something about my personality is if something looks good, I'll push it to the point of absurdity. That's absurdly light. That's way brighter than what's back there. But I want to see, I just tasted a good thing, and I want to see if I can push it just a little bit further. And I like it better yet. So 
what I'm doing right there is I'm overriding nature for sure. I'm definitely overriding nature here. And I'm going to turn the quarter. Just right there. Okay, cool. This looks really, this looks really good. So this passage, again, too murky to be such a prominent area but now it's caught up and it's gained interest. Am I gonna keep it that light? No, probably not. I'll go into it with more detail, but um, it's, definitely, it's definitely a leap forward in the right direction. And as it's going lighter back there, um, I'm just liking it more and more. So now I'm going to start putting in a little bit of detail. Um, I don't, if you see how dark this is right here, that dark right there almost competes <clears throat> with this right here. And so now I'm going to introduce this whole idea called um, atmospheric perspective. So we all know, uh, many of us know atmospheric perspective in landscape painting. And I believe it's Leonardo da Vinci who was the first one to actually write down that when you see a mountain in the distance, that that mountain in the distance, when it turns bluish purplish, what you're seeing when you look at that mountain and it's bluish purplish is you're actually seeing the air in between you and the mountain. And so he's the first person that we know of that wrote that down to my knowledge. Um, and so he called that atmospheric perspective and atmospheric perspective can be seen in that deep, deep landscape sense. Um, and let's actually do an exercise. If you're near a window, hold your hand up near the window and look at how dark your hand is as it's silhouetted with the bright, bright beyond it. Even if it's not a bright day, it's still gonna be bright. So look at how dark your hand is. And now put your hand down and then look out the window and look at that dark tree against the sky. So that dark tree against the sky, you might think to yourself, okay, that's a really dark tree. And I want to put that in, you know, super dark gray, brown, or whatever it might be um, against the sky, but it feels false. Well, here's the reason why, because your values, you're not seeing the full range of your values. Look at your hand now in front of the window. Now look at that dark tree and that dark tree isn't so dark anymore. The dark tree is actually a very, very light, brown, gray. Um, that's called atmospheric perspective. The things that are closest to you um, are, have the least amount of atmosphere. So between me and my hand, I have very little atmosphere. So I see its value much more so. But the more air, the more atmosphere in between you and an object, the more the value is affected by the atmosphere. So what happens with that? Here's what happens. The more atmosphere you have, the darker has become lighter and the lighter has become darker. So again, as atmosphere increases, the darker has become lighter and the lights become darker until you go far, 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 far in the distance and a sliver of land on Long Island Sound uh, just looks like a unified strip of practically like blue on a humid day. Um, so how does that pertain to this right here? Well, we actually use atmospheric painting in still life painting. Um, we use atmospheric perspective, I should say, in still life painting, where that dark right there may seem to be just as dark, we're only talking about value, as something right here, but I would never paint that that dark because then it would advance. So I'm going to tell a lie here and I'm going to put that dark in, but I'm gonna put it in much softer and I'm gonna pretend that there's more atmosphere between me and that background.
And over back at the pallet, back at the wrench, um, I have a much lighter value. That's my umber right out of the tube. And that's, that's it right there, much lighter. And so watch this, I'm gonna put this in. I don't even know if I'm gonna leave this in, but I wanna show you how I kind of creep in to get that value. So am I gonna leave it at that? Not sure. Maybe I wanna go a little bit darker. But I can tell you one thing that this detail work that I'm doing right now, that it's not overpowering this, all this right here. My highest contrast is right here. That's very low contrast. Consequently, that's receding. And this is advancing right here. And I'll play with it even a little bit further. If it doesn't feel like it's advanced, you know, has enough to it, then I'll just go a tiny bit darker. You can push and pull this. You don't have to be like, you know, say to yourself, oh no, I, I put that in and I lost it because I went too dark. Just hit it with a paper towel or hit it with paint to just loosen it up and make it a little bit lighter. Um, so with that right there, let's for a moment pretend that um, I went too dark there. I'll show you what you can do when you go too dark unintentionally. And again, I don't even know that I'm gonna put these shapes in, but I really wanted to illustrate today the principle of atmospheric painting and detail in the bathroom. So now, you have your moment on a canvas that you put in way too dark. And that moment on the canvas that's way too dark, you want to adjust it so that it just comes lighter. Well, this is a perfectly bone dry bristle brush. And what happens when you blend um, with a perfectly dry brush is as you move over a dark passage um, and there's a light passage that's a little bit wet beside it maybe, but as you move over a dark passage, the darks become lighter and the lights become darker. So dry brushes, the more you blend something, the darks, so let's pretend we're down here. I'll put my mouse stick down. The darks down here and the lights up there, the more you blend something, the more it goes like this until everything is just gray. <coughs> you know, everything is just the middle value. So if you look right here, as I hit this, and it would be much more so the case if I had wet paint over here, but it's still working. Maybe I'll grab a little bit of paint from down here. Put some wet paint to the side. But if I went too dark, if I went too sharp, I just hit it and the darks become lighter. So I don't know if that's picking up on live stream, but that just got a whole lot lighter to my eye here in the studio. And it became a whole lot less important. Again, I'm gonna poach some paint from down here. And the darks have become lighter and the lights are becoming darker. And if I kept on doing this for a few minutes, the whole, everything I just painted in would be wiped right out. So stepping back and looking at that, um, that detail um, right there, I don't know if, what that, uh, they call the coffered panel, I forget what that's even called, but that detail right there is definitely not overpowering this. It's there, but it's not too important. So I like where the slats of wood I like where they meet each other. And that's a little area of interest. It's, it's small, it's not gonna overpower. Where maybe I can go in and I can put information right here. Again, I don't really need to be obsessed. If I'm going too dark, too sharp, I can, I can just go back and soften it up or I can lighten it up. So I'll play with that. Maybe I'll go get the brush and soften that a little bit. 
So let's say now that's competing right here. So that line right there is competing with the handle. And now it's not, and yet it's still there. So it's there, but it's not over important. Which brings me back to the handle. And this is what I like to talk about in painting, the interconnectedness of everything. So all these parts are really interconnected and what running low on brushes. Oh, here they are. I have a load of brushes clean over to the side here. And let me just pick the perfect brush for this. You know what, for this mark, I'm gonna do something. I want a really crisp line. And so I'm going and I'm pulling out a brand new rosemary brush right here. That is a brush that's never been used. I open it up a little bit by dipping it in turpentine. You never want to snap a brush open, you can damage the ferrules. I don't know how to pronounce that, ferrule, ferrule, ferrule. Um, and I just get a little bit of black paint. I see a little tiny bit of red in that handle. And so if these are competing with each other, it really isn't a big deal. This is why I, I didn't complete the handle the other day, because I knew that it, I'd still be looking at the relationships around the handle. So then I come in right here. And look at how I strengthen that value. and how that became so much more important. If that was really dark, then those two would be vying for position. They would be fighting each other. But now that's very unimportant. That's become much more so important, but not as important as that. That's darker yet. So um, with that, I think we are right at the 45 minute mark. Um, and I wish I could keep on going painting. Um, but I think it's a good spot to call it a day. And I'll just point you to this area right here and to see how this came alive, whereas before it was just kind of like murky and gestured in, but now it came alive. And I'm really playing around with that whole idea of Chardin. And again, if you look up Chardin, Chardin, C-H-A-R-D-I-N, and then the copper cistern and Chardin's use of atmosphere and the way that he leaves, even sometimes he leaves the external contour painted in. Um, I'm almost, I'm kind of getting to the place where I'm convinced that Chardin um, influenced Van Gogh. Because when you look at the copper cistern, the way that Chardin leaves the heavy external line, I wonder if a uh, hundred years later or so, Van Gogh was looking at Chardin's. It's uh, very, very possible. And was affected in how he placed his paint down and let his paint be paint. So um, fun talking about like the two different schools, if you call them schools, but the two different schools, it's fun to take a look at that. And then to also now today have put it into practice. A lot of detail in certain areas, just suggestions in others. And tomorrow for sure, I will be jumping over here and I'll be looking uh, with a more precise eye at all the light coming through here and really studying Peter Kleiss. I'll probably pull up his file later today. I'll be looking at the spoon tomorrow and asking if that was an absolutely awful idea. Maybe it was, um, or if it's a decent idea, not sure. Um, and I'll have a better eye for it after my eye has um, gone off and relaxed for a little while. So um, I look forward to seeing you day 11, um, Monday at 1.15-ish. So thank you so much, guys. Talk to you then.